Thanks for the intro. So my name is Thierry Sleblon. I do research at EPFL in Switzerland. Um, and this talk is going to be about enforcing the digital immunity of uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, or ICRC. Um, to illustrate a couple of points I want to make at this point, this is a picture that we took while visiting a, a delegation of the ICRC that is based in an area bordering an, an armed conflict. Uh, so the a specificity of the ICRC is that it operates in those kinds of areas, armed conflicts and other violent situations. Uh, it does pretty much so globally. It's active in around 80 countries uh, as we speak. And to do so effectively in, in those very challenging environments, um, the ICRC benefits from privileges and immunities, or PNI. That brings us to the notion of uh, digital immunity, which we define as computer security and privacy that uh, is informed not only by technology, but also by organizational and legal factors. And so the point of this talk is really to uh, understand what practical factors influence the use of this kind of technology in humanitarian organizations and others. And it becomes urgent to do so uh, in the current context whereby data that is collected exclusively for uh, humanitarian action is sometimes used to, um, to surveil both the staff and the beneficiaries of the ICRC, as illustrated in these uh, news stories of uh, malware attacks against uh, field delegates, as well as this one uh, whereby beneficiaries were targeted with um, armed, uh, sorry, uh, military operations. So in this talk, I'll talk about the, the International Committee of the Red Cross, then I'll, I'll uh, touch upon some methodology uh, results, and we will propose an architecture that, in our view, will improve the situation of the ICRC and other organizations. So the ICRC, from a, a, an organizational standpoint, uh, was a three-time Nobel Peace Prize recipient. Uh, the first time with Henri Dunant, who was the founder of the organization over 150 years ago, and then in each of the two world wars. Um, since its creation, the organization has grown dramatically to today employ over 16,000 employees working in those 80 delegations that I mentioned. It has a budget that's twice that of my institution, the EPFL, every year. Uh, and those characteristics enable the ICRC to operate in very challenging environments, such as armed conflicts. Um, it is the only organization that visits detainees in Guantanamo, that provides medical care to uh, North Koreans, as well as provide physical forensics capability to the Mexican government. And so, as I mentioned briefly, to do so, the ICRC benefits from some legal backup uh, incarnated by privileges and immunities. So those privileges and immunities are uh, clauses in a bilateral agreement that is ratified by the ICRC as well as the states where the ICRC will, will operate. Two of the most relevant privileges and immunities are the inviolability of premises, which makes it illegal for local authorities to enter ICRC premises in those states. Um, so pretty much you can think of ICRC facilities as uh, diplomatic embassies, as an equivalent. And as well as freedom of communications for ICRC staff at least. So in those environments, the ICRC uh, staff can use Antoine encryption, uh, strong anonymity, and in principle, their communication should be immune to uh, censorship. So to give you a sense of how those PNI compare with other organizations, uh, you can look at this table. At the top, you have NGOs like Médecins Sans Frontières that typically do not benefit from any PNI. Uh, international organizations like the United Nations do benefit from some PNI, and the ICRC is the only organization uh, that benefits from the privilege of non-disclosure, which means that it cannot be legally compelled to disclose uh, humanitarian data to the authorities. And so, of course, that makes it a very attractive target for extrajudicial access by authorities and other parties to the conflict. So our methodology is as follows. We used an inductive approach, which means that we started with a set of theories 
uh, that we refined as we collected more data. We use a set of uh, qualitative tools, the primary one being semi-structured interviews, complemented with a survey to gain more qualitative information, as well as the review of internal documents and a, a, a field trip to um, an ICRC delegation bordering an armed conflict that, uh, as I mentioned initially. We carried out 27 interviews until we reached topic exhaustion, which is one of the requirements of those types of uh, qualitative studies, and combined the experience of the field workers that we interviewed amounted to over a quarter of a millennium of uh, experience at the ICRC, more if we were to include experience gained outside uh, the ICRC and other humanitarian organizations. So this is a summary of the characteristics of our interviewees. There are 27 of them. Um, they span pretty much all the operational units of the ICRC. That, that means that are in contact with the beneficiaries. So we have uh, data protection, economic security, forensics, health, also ICT, protection of civilian, restoration of family links, visit of detainees, water and habitat, and weapon contamination. The third column to the left represents the region where uh, the participants were active at the time of the interview. Those regions are rotated every nine to 24 months, so we cover more geographical diversity than what is shown on this table. And most interviews were carried out in English and lasted between 45 and um, 60 minutes. So going back to the geographical diversity of our participants. Here you can see the red circles represented where our participants operated, and the blue ones, all the other um, delegations of the ICRC as of today. So it's, uh, it's an organization that spans pretty much all areas of armed conflicts, and we had a good um, visibility of, uh, of the practices in different de delegations. So now we're gonna get to the results. We, um, we will talk about the data that is being collected by the ICRC, then see how this data is processed by the organization to provide humanitarian aid, and we will talk about also operational and legal factors that influence um, those data flows. So starting with the data, at the top you have units that provide um, goods to the beneficiaries that are called the assistance units. And at the bottom, you have the protection units that deal with uh, services, typically. There are three trends that you can see here. First, most units, both in assistance and protection, collect very personal data, um, as well as so full names, uh, medical data. The two units at the bottom of the assistance collect infrastructural um, data, which might also be sensitive when we deal with, uh, um, say, unexploded ornaments um, that might reveal how warfare is being conducted by certain countries. And finally, the units dealing with services, so for example, the visit of detainees in prisons, also collect IHL data, or international humanitarian law data that might contain um, violation by, by the authorities. So when reasoning about the sensitivity of the data, the interviewees referred to who would be the most affected by an unauthorized data leakage. Um, the beneficiaries could undergo retribution, for example, if their uh, criticism of the authorities were to be leaked. The ICRC could also experience loss of trust in the area where the data was leaked, or even globally, depending on the type of, uh, of data leakage. And governments could also suffer at the diplomatic level um, of a data leakage of ICRC data. So now we're gonna get to the data flows. And when we started this work, uh, we expected data to be similar to um, journalistic organizations whereby you have an anonymous source um, that is interested to disclose some data to 
one or a few journalists, so pretty simple flow with two nodes and one edge between them. It turns out that in each of those delegations, the flows of the ICRC are uh, much more complex than in most organizations. To the left, you have the collection. So on the horizontal dimension, you see the different stages involved in processing humanitarian data with collection, digitization, storage, management, and destruction. And on the vertical dimension, you see uh, the different types of units of the ICRC. The red flows correspond to those that are not covered by privileges and immunity, as I will describe in a second, and the green ones, those that are covered by privileges and immunity. Now we're gonna get into the factors that influence the structure of those data flows. So this is the organizational structure of the ICRC in all the delegations that you've seen. To the left, you have the field where data is collected and digitized, um, either directly by staff, by uh, field workers, or by going to a hospital where medical care is provided and data as a result is also being collected. In the middle, there is aggregation done in ICRC facilities that can be delegations or subdelegations for large countries that typically benefit from the inviolability of premises that I mentioned, unlike the hospital that is represented in the field. And then finally, data is also aggregated and managed at the level of, uh, at the global level in uh, ICRC's headquarters that are based in Switzerland. So going back to the factors, we identified uh, several practical factors based on the operations and the legality of ICRC's work. The first one is the vulnerability of beneficiaries. And so it marks a fundamental limitation of technology that in very uh, adverse environments, technology might not be used by field workers. So for example, in a prison environment, you need to leave your electronic device uh, at the entrance of the facility. And so the best that you can do in this case is to rely on paper forms and to pseudonymize and remove as much identifying information as you can. Then second uh, is capacity building, whereby uh, the ICRC staff must, must train staff that might not belong to the Red Cross or the ICRC uh, in state-owned facilities like hospitals. And so in, in this process, sensitive information might need to be disclosed to staff that is more susceptible to coercion, either because they do not benefit from PNI, because they are nationals of the country where medical care is being provided, or simply because they are more susceptible to coercion. And another aspect of uh, capacity building that uh, weakens operational security is uh, physical attacks, whereby infrastructure must be placed in facilities where data access or um, inviolability of premises is not present. And so with respect to technology, the need there is to build services that remain secure despite the partial compromise of its infrastructure. And finally, legal factors uh, come into play whereby data needs to be segregated per country, for example, and data sharings become problematic where when data is stored in jurisdictions with asymmetric legislations. So to summarize uh, what we've talked about so far, there are three main points. The first one is that data access should be granted to users that are carefully vetted based on their PNI, um, their citizenship, or generally their susceptibility to coercion. Second, operational security might be traded off um, based on various factors. And in particular, when establishing secure communications between field workers and, uh, and staff delegates, as well as when sharing data across uh, asymmetric legislations. And finally, we need to complement those uh, practical measures with technological ones that would uh, strengthen the security posture of the organization. And this is what we're gonna talk about now. 
So as I mentioned, in addition to our interview, we also conducted a survey, and this is the result um, of the satisfaction and the needs of field workers with respect to secure communication, data management, and processing. So what you see is that the need for um, security technology with respect to those three applications is uniformly high um, as perceived by the delegates. However, the satisfaction is rather low. And to quickly uh, browse at what might be the problem in, this in the context of communication, uh, typically secure communication applications lack end-to-end -end encryption. Um, when they do employ end-to-end -end encryption, then they might uh, exhibit metadata leakage, as is the case for Signal. So for example, ISPs, as well as the service providers, and um, the uh, cloud operator uh, are exposed with the metadata of who communicates with or, or who is exchanging and to encrypted messages over signal. And finally, although field delegates do not uh, have uh, professional smartphones, they do often carry personal smartphones uh, that lead to a large attack surface that they carry with them um, in the field. So in conclusion to the secure communication need, um, there, there is a need for a privacy enhancing network um, that would provide those properties within the organization for communications between staff. So if you remember, this is the organizational structure with the, the factors influencing field work. And so what we're proposing is to continue exploring the needs and the practices as well as to propose training to field workers as we roll out new technology to deploy, if you will, an organizational anonymity network that would provide end-to-end -end encryption as well as metadata reduction um, to uh, field workers, as well as to carefully place um, infrastructure in locations with different levels of trust to benefit the most trusted locations. And finally, we also envision to uh, deploy an internal blockchain for access control that would benefit from um, the combined security and, uh, and legal protection of different secure rooms located in different jurisdictions. And finally, processing to facilitate the sharing of data uh, among those uh, delegations. Okay, so that concludes my talk. Uh, we've seen that there was a strong need for uh, new security technology that was tailored to the practicality of field work. Uh, to close this gap, we will be continuing to collaborate with the ICRC and other humanitarian organizations to integrate the applications that they need uh, into a usable platform. And finally, we envision to create a foundation in Switzerland that combines the perceived neutrality of academia with uh, industrial capacity in order to deploy security technology in those organizations. I will take any questions now if you have. Thank you. I guess I have a simple one, um, which may be very complicated. <laughs> to what extent do you run into difficulties with international privacy laws that are different from one country to another, or is that not a problem? No, I think it pertains to the legal factors that I was mentioning. So one good example is that at the moment there is a, a, an immigration crisis in, uh, in Europe whereby uh, migrants from the northern Africa are trying to, to reach Western Europe. And so this migration crosses 30 different jurisdictions uh, with different delegations, and data needs to be segregated legally um, in each of those delegations. But at the same time, uh, in order to restore family links, this data needs to be uh, correlated among those jurisdictions. And so there, there is a need for technology that would enable this use. Does that answer your question? Okay.
Hi, uh, if I caught it correctly, uh, I'm Joshua from OCI. If I caught it correctly, you recommended blockchain for uh, room access. Uh, blockchain is kind of a, a decentralized technology, so I guess what, how would blockchain or decentralized uh, management uh, help in this situation? So it is, it per the, so it's a proposed architecture. This is not uh, something that we've started to work on yet. Uh, the benefit of blockchain, as a, of blockchain as I see it is that it would enable to, to combine um, the operational security as well as the, so the access control and the, the PNI of different uh, server rooms located in different delegations and it would enable to, to combine that so um, for example when, when an access is granted to data then it would be visible in all delegations that participated in granting this access. It would be very difficult for an adversary to remove data accesses. It would, you, now the adversary would need to compromise every single of those delegations that participate in the access. Thanks. We can do one more real quick question. Hi, um, my name is Marla from York University in Canada. Um, so previously in your presentation you stated that people who are working um, from the country that the ICRC branch is stationed in uh, do not experience the PNI, um, the legal aspects of the PNI? So it depends okay. uh, whether they are employed by the ICRC. So there are different categories of people, if you will, those that are employed by headquarters, th mm -hmm. those that are employed, so they do benefit from PNI, those that are employed uh, by the delegation. Mm -hmm. And in general, those people are uh, citizen of the country. And so what I, what I meant is that they are more susceptible because you know, their relatives and, and their uh, ownership is based in the country. It's, it's harder for them to, to leave the country if they are being coerced. Would they be given any kind of immunity? Um, yes, so they, they, they do benefit from PNI in principle, okay. but it might be more difficult to, to use it Enforced. effectively. Yes, right. and finally there is a third category of people uh, that would be the, those working for the Red Cross National Society, mm -hmm. which is separate from the ICRC and typically does not benefit from PNI. It's an NGO um, that is subject to the laws of the local country. Do you think this would make communication, like secure communication and such, a little bit complicated, um, like between those organizations and those individuals, um, or would that not affect the? Yes, and, and so uh, special care should be taken when the communication crosses uh, an organizational boundary. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.